Hello, I'm Katie Brandt, Director of Caregiver Support Services and Public Relations for the Massachusetts General Hospital Frontal Temporal Disorders Unit and co-chair of the NAPA Advisory Council on Alzheimer's Services. On behalf of my co-chair, Dr. Alan Levy, and our entire council, it's my pleasure to welcome the chair of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the NIH, Dr. Anthony Fauci, to our meeting today. Dr. Fauci, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Good to be with you. We've just listened to a presentation on COVID mortality, where we heard sobering statistics about the excessive deaths in our dementia community caused by COVID-19 infections. In addition to data like this, many of us know stories of loss and heartbreak in our dementia community because of COVID. Dr. Fauci, we hope you can provide information about how the COVID vaccine might impact individuals living with dementia and also speak to the importance of the vaccine as it relates to our dementia population and direct care workers in the long-term care and home care settings so we can move forward with safety in our vulnerable population. Well, one of the things that's very clear uh, on the basis of the prioritization that have been set is that the, t that the first priority, which is the 1A classification by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which has advised the CD CDC, is healthcare providers and people in extended care facilities, such as nursing homes and long-term care facilities. So I think you're hearing right from the beginning the importance of vaccinating people in those types of settings because Obviously, not everyone who is in a nursing home or an extended care facility has Alzheimer's, and there are many Alzheimer's patients who are taken care of at home. But for those who are in um, uh, situations in which there is congregate settings, like in a nursing home, that the risk of spread of infection and deleterious consequences of infection are profoundly more in a nursing home setting. So to the extent in which many Alzheimer's patients are in a nursing home setting, if you look at the percentage of deaths throughout the country, definitely disproportionately more among people in nursing homes, long-term care facilities, prisons, pl places like that, where people are congregating together. So to me, that underscores the importance of getting vaccinated not only the people in such settings, but also the caretakers of those people. This also applies for Alzheimer's individuals who are at home, in the, in the home setting, that you want to make sure that they get protected. So, I mean, there's a lot of questions that I'll ask, and I'm sure you'll ask me <laughs> specifically about vaccinating people with Alzheimer's, but no doubt they are a high priority group because of the nature of their disease and the settings in which they often find themselves, namely congregate settings such as nursing homes. Congregate settings, and we often know that our loved ones with dementia are not able to fully follow the guidelines of mask wearing or social distancing. It can be challenging because of their cognitive impairment. And Dr. Fauci, what would you say to a caregiver who asks, does my loved one with dementia have extra risk factors related to taking the COVID vaccine? Well, the answer is uh, likely not. And the reason is that when you talk, I mean, everyone who gets vaccinated will get these degree of mild symptoms after the prime and maybe some maybe more prolonged symptoms of hurt in the arm, little ache maybe some aches and pains, myalgias, muscle aches and pains, and possibly even some fever. But putting those aside, the only consideration that you would have regarding a vaccine is not a safety consideration, but a question I often get asked, is someone who has Alzheimer's uh, maybe not gonna make as robust an immune response. You know, the work of maybe their immune system might be uh, not as robust as the immune system of an otherwise, quote, normal person. So I don't think it's a safety issue. The question is, given the age of many people with Alzheimer's and given the fact that 
robust immune responses tend to diminish with age, that I wouldn't say it's a safety issue. I'd more say that will they get the total full degree of protection that someone who is an otherwise healthy young person. Thank you for speaking to that. It's so important. You know, research also increasingly supports a role for inflammation in dementia, including systemic inflammation. Do you anticipate that COVID and inflammation associated with the infection, including chronic inflammation, could precipitate or exacerbate Alzheimer's disease? Similarly, could an immune response to the vaccine in a patient with dementia potentially cause inflammation that could accelerate the disease? The degree of inflammation that you can get if you have a serious enough COVID infection to warrant Uh, medical attention, certainly um, if in fact one makes an assumption, which is not an unreasonable assumption, that a burst of inflammation could exacerbate Alzheimer's. And the reason I would say that is that one thing that we are seeing, and it's a real phenomenon and we're putting a lot of effort into following it, is that people who do get symptomatic COVID-19 disease, a certain percentage of them get lingering of symptoms, uh, even symptoms they didn't have during the acute disease. And one of those is what people are referring to for lack of a better terminology as brain fog, like an inability to concentrate and an inability to focus. And given that's one of the issues you have with Alzheimer's, I don't think there's any pathophysiological proof of that But the association of these types of neuropsychiatric issues with people who are otherwise non-Alzheimer's individuals who get that, I don't think it's a stretch to imagine that this is something that we at least need to take a look at and study because it could be that that burst of an inflammatory response could actually exacerbate. Again, no definitive proof, but it's something that biologically makes sense that that could happen. With regard to the inflammation that's associated with vaccines, you know, that varies from person to person. There's very little significant uh, inflammatory response after the first shot, considerably more after the boost. Of note, I got my boost about three hours ago. (laughs) (laughs) That's great to hear. (laughs) So we'll see later on in the day and tomorrow whether I I have, you know, an inflammatory response that makes me achy or something like that. But it could be significant enough in response to the vaccine, though I would think not nearly in the ballpark of what you would see with actual infection. So I wouldn't hesitate to vaccinate an Alzheimer's individual. Uh, because you're concerned that the inflammation associated with the vaccine is going to be harmful to them. Thank you for speaking to that. And thank you for sharing that you got your boost. That's wonderful news. So an important question that family members have is, how can we get back to a time of safe visits? And a question that's on their mind is, if their loved one has received a vaccine, but they yet have not, is it safe to resume in-person visits in a, a skilled nursing facility or assisted living memory care? Well, you know, it depends on what the conditions of visits are because it really may vary. So if a person gets vaccinated, so take this hypothetical person who's Alzheimer individual who is in a nursing home gets vaccinated. Well, since, as we mentioned just a moment ago, the robustness of the response might not be at the level of an otherwise healthy young person, is no guarantee that that person is protected. So even though we know the vaccine in the broad population is 94 to 95% efficacious, we don't know what it's gonna be for that person, that, that individual. Number two, even if it is 94 to 95% efficacious in protecting against clinically recognizable disease, it may not protect you against asymptomatic infection, which means you may have the virus in your nasopharynx and you may be spreading it. That's the reason why we say that masks should continue to be worn until we are completely certain 
as to whether the vaccine protects you against infection? I think there are a lot of things to consider, but families will be um, excited to know that hope is on the horizon. We know that underrepresented minorities may have a history of negative experiences with the medical and research community. For individuals in our dementia community, including our direct care workers who have a connection with this history, how can we communicate the safety and importance of this vaccine? Well, I think that minority communities have an understandable historical reason why they're skeptical about things like vaccine programs. So we have to respect that skepticism, but in a non-pejorative way, we've got to explain to them and ask them, what is the reason besides the history, which now they should understand that safeguards have been put in place by committees such as ethics committees and others that would make it essentially impossible, uh, literally impossible for those things to happen if people abide by the guidelines. And that you're talking about the ethics reviews that you have before a protocol can be put into place. So having said that, um, when you look at a minority population, you've got to say, tell me what it is that makes you hesitant, apart from skepticism about the Tuskegee issue. Uh, well, they say, well, it's, it's too quick. You went too quick. It must have been sacrificing safety. You need to explain that the speed is purely a reflection of the extraordinary scientific advances in vaccine platform technology that have occurred that have allowed us to do things in months that normally would have taken years. Then the next question they may ask is, well, you know, you say it's safe and effective. How do I know it's safe and effective? Is it the federal government trying to put something over on us or is it the company trying to make a lot of money? Well, you explain to them that the trials are conducted in tens of thousands of people and the data are evaluated independently by an independent data and safety monitoring board, which is the only one that sees the data first. And if it looks like it's favorable, they then allow the company to see the data The company examines it and presents it to the FDA in order to get what you might call an emergency use authorization. But the career scientists, not the politicians at the FDA, make a decision in association with their own independent advisory committee. So you want to impress upon the minority populations that the speed did not sacrifice safety or scientific integrity And the process of determining if something works is based on something that is purely independent and transparent. And I think if you do that, you know, in a in a relaxed way with people, uh, you would convince many, not all, but you'd convince many that it's an appropriate thing to go get vaccinated. Such an important message. Dr. Fauci, as we close out our time together today, I'm hoping that you might impart some wisdom to our council. Um, You're aware that Alzheimer's disease and related dementias are considered a global epidemic by many. Some similarities may extend to the need for better early diagnosis, screening and testing, and hopefully the infrastructure necessary for deploying widespread treatment. From your experience, are there lessons learned you'd like to share with us to guide our council as we move forward to ensure the country is prepared as we anticipate the dementia epidemic and need to improve testing, diagnosis, care, and ultimately availability of treatments? Yes, I think you said it all when you said this is inevitable that you're going to get a larger numbers of individuals and epidemic proportion. We know that. We see the dynamics already. So my experience in a number of diseases that are infectious diseases like HIV AIDS is you want to be a few steps ahead of the dynamics of the outbreak. So for example, when we were developing drugs for HIV in the very early years of the 80s, I built a clinical trials network that were able to be doing the testing of these drugs of a group of investigators that were ready to go as the drugs came in. So it was an infrastructure of clinical trials. And I'm not so sure that that would work and fit for Alzheimer's, 
but the principle of anticipating the needs that you will have two, three, four, five years from now and start working on building the, the foundation for those needs, I think is the best advice I can give you because it worked well with HIV and it put us ahead of the game and we were very successful, as you well know, in developing extraordinarily effective drugs for HIV. It's incredibly impressive and has changed the trajectory of people's lives. And that's what we hope to do for Alzheimer's and related dementias. Dr. Fauci, uh, I'd like to thank you for all the work that you're doing to help all of us be safe and healthy, um, not only in 2021, but in the years to come. And we're so appreciative of your time and attention for our community today. Thank you, Katie. It's been good to be with you.